chapter, Leviticus 20, beginning in verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Moloch, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will set my face against that man, and will cut him off from among his people, because he hath given of his seed unto Moloch to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do in any wise hide their eyes from the man, which when he giveth of his seed unto Moloch, and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family, and will cut him off, and all that go a-whoring after him to commit whoredoms with Moloch from among their people. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits, and after wizards, to go a-whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul, and will cut him off from among his people. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God, and ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. For every one that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother, his blood shall be upon him. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death, they have wrought confusion, their blood shall be upon them. If a, man lie, if a man also lie with mankind, as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. And if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire, both he and they, that there be no wickedness among you. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and ye shall slay the beast. And if a woman approach unto any beast and lie down thereto, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast, they shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. And if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and see her nakedness, and she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He hath uncovered his sister's nakedness, he shall bear his iniquity. And if a man shall lie with a woman having her sickness, and shall uncover her nakedness, he hath discovered her fountain. And she hath uncovered the fountain of her blood, and both of them shall be cut off from among their people. And thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, nor of thy father's sister, for he uncovereth his near kin, they shall bear their iniquity. And if a man shall lie with his uncle's wife, he, shall, he hath uncovered his uncle's nakedness, they shall bear their sin, they shall die childless. And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness, they shall be childless. Ye shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them. That the land whither I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. And ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things, and therefore abhorred them. But I have said unto you, Ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. Ye shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean beasts, and between unclean fowls and clean. And ye shall not make your souls abominable by beast, or by fowl, or by any manner of living thing that creepeth on the ground, 
which I have separated from you as unclean. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have severed you from other people, that ye should be mine. A man also, or woman, that hath a familiar spirit, or that is a wizard, shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones, their blood shall be upon them. So this is on the heels end, by plan, of my Put to Death series. Throughout the month of May, every Sunday, I dealt with a particular area of, of how I believe God divides it up, or how I could easily divide up the different types of capital punishment. And so that series, and presenting that series, I intended to show a biblical as well as a balanced teaching on capital punishment and how it applies to the Bible and how it should apply to us here as Bible-believing Christians abiding in Canada, okay? As we studied through that, we found adultery, we found smiting father and mother, we found first-degree murder, kidnapping, when your unruly beast that was wont to push before time went and killed somebody, um, as, as manners of somebody put to death, we found blasphemy in the name of the Lord. We found working on the Sabbath day. We found if a stranger approaches nigh into the tabernacle, false prophets proselytizing. We found people giving their seed unto Moloch or child sacrifice. We found that people that lie with beasts or with father's wife or with daughter-in-law or with mother-in-law were all worthy biblically of being put to death. And I believe the law of the Lord is perfect, true, righteous, just, and applicable today in the context in which we are living. And were we living in a righteous nation, they would open the Bible and say, Thus saith the Lord, and enact the capital punishments as is appropriate in the scriptures, and as is mandated and commanded by God above. God is not unjust in putting the adulterer to death. He's not unjust in putting a child that smites his father or mother to death. He's not unjust in taking a false prophet that is proselytizing to go and serve other gods and commanding that his people Israel put that man to death. God is just and righteous to do so. And in the context in which they lived, that was the law of the land, and that should have been enacted every time, without respect of persons, without unrighteousness and judgment. The law of the Lord is true, converting the soul. The statutes of the Lord are right, changing the minds of the simple, the Bible records, as a paraphrase. Now, many months ago, not because I endorsed the preacher or whatever, but because I saw a statement made that fit this perfect because a lot of Baptist preachers right and we'll hold them more accountable because these are the ones that say that they believe the Bible correct by and large the United Church from Canada we're not going to hold them to the standard of a Bible that they reject right they're, they're just off doing their own thing their religion is is not biblical Christianity but the biblicists the ones that trust the Bible will take a different position on Leviticus chapter 13 and a lot of the times they do it based on their own personal feelings and so I heard a pastor, many of us know him well, give the Leviticus 2013 challenge. And I took this challenge and I emailed it out to hundreds of Baptist contacts in Canada, right? And gave them the same challenge, a clip as well as a write-up of my own opinions on, on the clip. And the challenge was pretty simple. Basically, if you disagree with what I believe is biblical in regards to Leviticus chapter 20 and 13, now is a great time, being June, for you to stand up and thunder from your pulpits what Leviticus chapter 20 and 13 really means. Great time to prove all of us wrong who take this position, and you're going to stand over here. Perfect time for you to set the record straight. So the challenge was this, and I thought it was presented very well. First and foremost, explain the context of chapter 20 and how the theme fits into the greater theme of the chapter. Secondly, explain what the verse means and the practical application to the people that heard it. Third, explain the New Testament doctrine on the verse how do we interpret these scriptures as New Testament believers? And finally and fourth, 
explain the practical application for the verse in 2020 to an individual Christian. Okay? And these, this challenge really is just a challenge to preach biblically. Because biblical preaching is opening up the Bible, giving the context, and applying it to people today. A lot of the times you have to tread into the inner parts of that, that challenge and talk about the people then to compare them to the people now. But where the rubber meets the road, we need to take these words and figure out what they mean to us standing here today. And Leviticus chapter 20, 13 is no different. What does it mean to us? And the first point is, let's just get into it. Explain the context of chapter 20 and how the theme fits into the greater theme of Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13. So go with me back then, so we're not skipping anything. We read the whole chapter in context, correct? We got that verse in context by reading the whole chapter. Amen. Go to verse 1, chapter 1 and verse 1. The book of Leviticus, and I guess I'm going to just kind of flip through it. Basically, Leviticus 1 through 7, you can kind of flip through it. And maybe if you have titles at the top, look at it. Look for keywords and find what the Bible's saying. I like to um, put little square brackets around a topic, right? So in chapter 2 and verse 1, you'll find, And when any will offer a meat offering, I've made it green, and I've put a little bracket around it, so that I know that this is the topic that's being dealt with. Leviticus 1 through 7, you're going to find the sacrifices, burnt sacrifice, the meat offering, the peace offering in chapter 3. In chapter 4, you're going to find the sin offering, and then furthermore, you're going to find the um, sin by trespass and the offering that goes through that in chapter 5. The subsequent chapters, 6 and 7, kind of give you a second witness and also some more clarity to each one of those offerings. Leviticus 1 through 7, different offerings given to the people of Israel. Leviticus chapter 8 and in verse and, and chapter 9, you're going to find the consecration or the setting aside of the Levitical priests being Aaron and his sons at this time. They're being consecrated and set aside for a particular job. In Leviticus chapter 10, unfortunately, you find previous was the consecration, now you have the desecration by those same Levites that were anointed for their job. Um, Nadab and Abihu in chapter 10 offer strange fire unto God and they're put to death because of it. That's giving credence to God's commands that, hey, here are sacrifices, here are my ordained priests and the job they have. If you don't follow it, you will be punished very severely. And that was enacted there in Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 11, you begin to find out about clean versus unclean. This is peace. This is... Um, Yes, a dietary law or restriction that was given to the people of Israel, but also it's kind of a type of how the people of Israel ought to live. And we find that later on that they put clean difference between clean and unclean to show you that ye ought to be holy. Many, 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 many years later, Peter came to a revelation as, as unclean beasts fell from the sky, and God said, Eat, Peter. Rise and eat. And he said, nothing unclean. And he's referring back to Leviticus chapter 11 here. And he says, nothing unclean has touched my lips. And God says, what I have cleansed, call thou not unclean. And he used this example way back then to be a type of, they are not unclean anymore because I have cleansed them. And what he was teaching Peter was that he needs to stop just proselytizing the Jews and go and seek after the Gentiles. I have dubbed them, I have cleansed them to be a clean at this point. And so that's what this dietary restriction actually gives us in the, in the long run. But here it's simply eat this, don't eat this. This is clean, this is unclean. Go to chapter 12 and you're going to find conception and birthing and the purifying that should take place. If it's a man child or a maid child and, and what the woman's to do and how long she would be unclean for after giving birth. Very good practical knowledge there. Baptists too often will have a woman have a baby on Friday and she's struggling to get into church on 
Sunday so as to not forsake the assembly. Well, the Bible does give principle and credence to the fact that there ought to be a time of separation where mom gets no baby, also because things aren't healed yet. There should be space given. That's what God gives you. And this little wee chapter of chapter 12 is, is good practical instruction for child bearing and then birthing. What should take place after? Chapter 13 verses, or through chapter 14, through chapter 15, we find the law of leprosy as well as issues, okay? So how the priest is to deal with people that are leprous or unclean or sick by way of some disease or by way of, of um, some uncleanness at that time. Chapter 16, I'm trying to get the context here of Leviticus chapter 20. Chapter 16 is the scapegoat as well as more teaching on feasts that are to take place at the people um, of Israel. And so we can continue on and we turn over. Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 1 and 2 it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons and to all the children of Israel, and say unto them, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, saying... And so we're talking about commands of God pretty much through all of this. God is commanding his leaders, Israel, of Israel, Aaron and, and Moses, to command the people in these things. Chapter 17 deals with blood and the eating of it and the importance of blood. The blood, it says in verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Therefore, don't jab things into your blood in order to get life. Right? That doesn't make sense. The life is already in the blood. Also, when you're sick, don't drain blood. I mean, George Washington learned a hard, life, a hard lesson, didn't he? They drained blood to try to give him life. Oh, life's in the blood. Just leave the blood alone. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then he talks about how you shouldn't eat it. Why you shouldn't eat it is because that's where the life is. They were to pour it out. Okay? Leviticus chapter 18, and we'll start reading in verse 1. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. Okay, so what you used to do, you don't do now. And then what is he going to say further? And after the doings of the land in Canaan, whither I bring you, ye shall not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. God is saying before and behind, don't follow those examples. This is your example. This is what I'm about to teach you. Right? Because he says, shall ye not do, neither shall ye walk in their ordinances, verse 4, ye shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. Okay? So God is making it clear. Don't do their ways. Don't do their ways. Do my ways. He's about to give them statutes and judgments, and yea, he's already given them some, as we've been reading through it and just walking through. Go home tonight and read Leviticus chapter 1 through 16. If you can stay awake that late in the night, amen, power to you. I might fall asleep, but read through them and see what God's trying to tell us in the context of those things. He's trying to give people a proper way to live. After his ways, after his statutes, after his judgments. Why? Because I am the Lord. Don't do what those are doing because they weren't following me, is what God's saying here. Then, we see in Leviticus 18, he starts to deal with wicked physical relationships. He talks about, in verse 6, None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin unto him to uncover their nakedness. And that's going to be the theme of that chapter. He talks about different wicked physical relationships and how men ought not to do those things. Then you get to Leviticus chapter 19. Begin in verse 1. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And God is just pounding this into their minds and hearts. Now ye shall be holy because I am holy. And then he starts into some laws about offerings and more relational laws. The peace offering in verse 5. And then we're going to find different relational, not physical, but relational and how we deal with people. Different laws there. Look at verse 11 quickly. Ye shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. 
That's wisdom there. That, that's good, right? Wouldn't the world be a better place if we didn't steal, if we didn't lie to one another? Look at verse 13. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night to morning. God giving principle to business owners that they shouldn't withhold wages. Some of us are used to getting paid weekly, and for that time, our boss holds the wages. It's kind of just the way books are kept these days. Sometimes it's for two weeks. But if you're a Christian, you can look at this practical teaching and not withhold wages. In other words, every day worked is a day paid. Every day works is a day paid. If you do have it set up or you hold it for a week or two weeks or whatsoever, then when the man comes and says, hey, can I have my wage from yesterday? It ought to be ready to give it to them. Biblically speaking, that's a good practical lesson for anyone that has owned a business or hire somebody to do a job. Don't withhold it till morning. Pay when the work is done. Verse 14. Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, which shall fear thy God. I am the Lord. Doesn't that make sense? You're going you're gonna to throw something in front of a blind person so that they trip and fall? Are you going to curse the deaf? Like, these are that's an awful thing to do. Somebody that has a defect to their body that they didn't have any control over. They're born blind. They're born. You should, offer, you should offer them more grace and more love and more help. Don't put a stumbling block, but be the one that, that looks for a stumbling block in front of the blind and, and helps him around and removes it out of his way, right? Good, sound teaching that everybody would say, yeah, that's a good thing, unless you're some wicked, awful person. It continues on. In verse 15, you shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. In other words, in judgment, everyone's on an equal playing field. Don't judge the rich differently than you would judge the poor. Rather, judge righteously. All good things that most people would agree with. Then we get down to verse 17. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon them. You know what that's saying? You hate your neighbor if you're not helping them in the way of righteousness. That's telling you to look out for your brother and sister in Christ. And when you see something that maybe they're spiritually blind to, you know, you're keeping their six is like a military term. Keep their six, right? Because if you look at a clock, my six is behind me. And spiritually speaking, I don't see what's sneaking up on me. But Brother Jamie can certainly see that. And he could come to me and say, hey, because I love you, I want to show you that you have something spiritually lacking. There's a direction that you're going in where you're spiritually needing help. You can't see what's coming behind you. And he, he, instead of hating me, he loves me enough to tell me when something is coming upon me and I don't see it. I don't see my sins all the time. It takes somebody else to point out my sin. I don't see my sins. My wife sees all my sins, so ask her, right? <laughs> and she'll tell you very clearly, yeah, he, he does this and that and this, and she'll have a big long list. I'm only joking. But the truth is, is we all need that love in our life where our brother would love us enough to rebuke us when we fall short of the glory of God and sin. Now look at verse 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? That's Jesus. He brought that to the New Testament in the Beatitudes, one of the most famous sermons he ever preached. He said, love thy neighbor as thyself. Here in the context, God reveals that that's the children of thy people. That's not just everybody. That's the children of thy people, thy neighbor, that, those that are close unto you. Love them as yourself is what the Bible is encouraging. And everybody, red, yellow, black, white, you know, whatever status you are, so many people, atheists, agnostic, right, Buddhists, they'll all say, yes, love thy neighbor as thyself. That's Jesus' teaching. That's, the, that's one of the most important teachings. They'll lift that up. But here it's found in Leviticus in the context of what we're dealing with. Leviticus 20.13, love thy neighbor as thyself. Many would agree with many of the teachings here. Then we turn over to Leviticus chapter 20. And here we're going to find many of the laws that he's referring to are stuff that's been mentioned previous, specifically in Leviticus chapter 18. Now he's applying, he's taking the laws and applying penalties to them. Okay, so if you would look in Leviticus chapter 20, in verse 11, it says, And the man that lieth with his father's wife. Okay, that came from chapter 18 and verse 8. And he says, He hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. 
their blood shall be upon him. So previous we knew that lying with your father's wife was a great sin, but we did not have that example of what should be done about it. He shall be put to death, the Bible is now teaching. Verse 12, and if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, okay, that comes from Leviticus 18 and verse, uh, sorry, yeah, 18 and verse 18 or 15, I think it is. And it says, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. Then we get to Leviticus. You can go to 20 and verse 15. It says, if a man lie with a beast, he hath surely he shall surely be put to death. And ye shall slay the beast. And that comes from Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 18, I believe. I can't read my own writing. But that is talking about men laying with a beast, and they shall surely be put to death, putting the punishment upon the sin that was mentioned previous. Now here we are, Leviticus chapter 20, and in verse 13, If a man also lie with womankind, as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. Leviticus 18 and verse 22 reads, Thou shalt not lie with mankind, as with womankind, it is abomination. Giving the dual witness to it being an abomination, but here in Leviticus 20, it's saying what the penalty is for it. The context is that in this, this book, Leviticus, is dealing with holiness, justice, judgment, cleanness, righteousness, the proper and good way of God. Leviticus 20, then, as a chapter, here is highlighting clearly what God has said and showing us how God feels about it. We've seen the command to not lay with beasts. We've seen the command to not lay with your father's wife. We've seen the command that men ought not lay with mankind as they lay with a woman. Why? Because it's abomination. God feels it's abomination. He also feels that it is worthy of death to the point where it says their blood shall be upon them. They shall be put to death. Men who lie with mankind as they would with a woman. So he's showing that he feels that the filth mentioned in this context, the corruption, the perversion, the wickedness mentioned in this context is worthy of a firm penalty. Those that commit such things. If you're guilty in one of these areas, the judgment is clear, and it's a righteous judgment on this type of perversion. So that there is the chapter in the context and the theme and how it fits into this book of Leviticus as a whole. Secondly, we're going to explain what the verse means and the practical application to the specific people of Israel that heard it. So go to Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13, and let's break this verse apart. It starts off and it says, and, so that's just saying it's a continuation of thought. It says, um, nope, sorry, it doesn't say that. It says, if, verse 13, if is a condition, right? Anyone who's a programmer knows this. If is a condition. A man, verse 13, if a man, there's your subject of the verse we're about to deal with. What's the verb? If a man lie with, there's your verb. So there's a condition regarding the subject of man, and the verb or the action is he lie with. Now, let's keep our finger there in Leviticus 20, and I'm going to go to the first mention of lie with in Genesis chapter 19. Lie with, okay? God here is using a euphemism. He doesn't feel the need to be graphic in this, but we can go to the first mention of lie with and find out exactly what God means. This is why I love the King James Bible, is because you can use it as its own dictionary. It's not always the first mention, but usually the first mention gives you a clear indication of how the Bible is going to use that word or phrase through the entirety of it. Okay, you don't need a lot of the tools that we use. Well, they're beneficial, like going to a Webster's dictionary. Or going, the King James, honestly, of itself is its own dictionary. I love that about it. So, when I want to find out what lie with mankind means, I go to the Bible, and here in Levit or Genesis chapter 19, and verse 30, we're going to learn from it with that very first meaning, very first mention. Genesis 19, verse 30, And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain, and his two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zoar, 
And he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. Okay, so we have a man here with two of his daughters. Many of us know this story. And the firstborn, this is the daughter, said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Okay, so there again is some of that vague description. God not need to be so specific, but I believe the same term, come in unto us, is the same one we're going to find when we look at that statement, lie with. Okay? So we have daughters that don't have a man, but they have their father here. Verse 32 continues, come let us make our father drink wine, and we will, here it is, we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of thy father. Now, preserving seed, again, what is God talking about here? Okay, continue reading. And they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and laid with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down or when she rose. So he drank wine to the point where he did not know what was happening unto him. Verse 34, And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto his younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him. And he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Thus, and here it is, here's what's going to connect the lie with and the preserve seed, and the come in unto all together, because this is what we've been talking about the whole time. Verse 36, thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. So they became with child by everything that had proceeded. We don't, we've got adults here. We don't need to imagine what's going on, okay? What it's saying is lie with is that relation. They said, let us lie with, they lay with their father, and after, both of them became with child as a result, okay? So we can continue, go back to Leviticus chapter 20. So lie with is the marital bed. Should be. Obviously, that is a horrible example. And that is actually one that would be captured in the context of Leviticus chapter 20. I'll be put to death, okay? The Bible then reads in Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13, if a man also, and that's a key word that we kind of skipped over because the actual subject is the man and the verb is the lie with, this also there is an indication as, as both are happening. So there, there are two instances of what's going to happen. I'll show it. If a man lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, he also indicates that they lie with or have the relation, the men have the relation with mankind as well as with the woman. Both of them, the man and the man, have committed abomination. They shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. So he also says, as with the woman, so will they lay with mankind. These are opposites. So the both indicates man with man can happen, and the other indicates the woman with woman. Now, some will make plays with that term mankind and, and, and say that it means something different. But in the context of Leviticus 20, and specifically in the same verse as, as verse 13, it says, If a man lie, also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, okay, so that's telling you that mankind and woman are opposites, they're, they're, they're being exchanged as such, signified by the comma that is there. If he lie, it can be easily read if he lie with man. The, the, the kind is just the group, man group. Group of men, right? If he lies with a group of men, as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed abomination, those shall surely be put to death. So what would be a proper relation in the marital bed is being taken between a man and a man. Gross. If they have committed an abomination, the Bible says, that is something that is disgusting. That is something that is a hated thing. That is something that is abhorrent. And that term abomination rings throughout the Bible. And every single time you find it, you're going to find something that makes your stomach turn. Just a little bit. It's abhorrent. It's disgusting. It's no good. It's, it's, it's putrefying, okay? Now the application then of this, what does this verse mean specifically to the people in the context that are hearing it, is that if two men do this abomination, 
They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Meaning the blood guiltiness shall be upon them for the action that they make. But also physically there should be blood upon them. In other words, the action to destroy that life comes with a smiting or a striking. Stone them with stones is what the Bible prescribes as an excellent and efficient way to put somebody to death. They bleed as a result of it because of the breaking of the skin and the impact made by the stones upon the flesh. So it says they shall be put to death, two men coming together in a relation that should be normal between a man and a wife. Two men come together and they should be put to death as a result of it. The application of the people, don't do this. Don't do this thing. It's abomination to God. You'll be put to death if you do. It's abhorrent. It's disgusting. Don't do this thing. That is the practical application. But in the context of chapter 20, God doesn't just say, don't do this. He says, do this. He gives you the example of what you should do. Look at verse 7. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. So he's saying, do right, don't do wrong. I am the Lord which sanctify you. What he's indicating is that anybody that does what is mentioned here is not sanctified, is not holy, is not keeping the statutes, is not following after the sanctifying process of the living God. They're completely different. They're abhorrent. They're disgusting, right? Verse 22 continues and explains, we saw how people ought to be sanctified and sanctify themselves. Now God's going to talk about the nation in that same context. Verse 22, you shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them. Let the land, whither I bring you to dwell therein, spew you not out. And ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things, therefore I abhorred them. He's saying individuals, he's saying collective, don't live this way, follow my statutes, otherwise the land will agree with me and vomit you out. God says here, therefore because that land did these things, I abhorred them. I abhorred them. So that is the verse and the practical application to the specific people hearing it. Now, next, explain the New Testament doctrine on the verse. How do we interpret these scriptures as New Testament believers? You can keep your finger there in Leviticus, and I'm going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. How do I, in the New Testament, interpret these scriptures? As a believer, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So this is saying that all scripture, okay, even Leviticus, is that, is Leviticus 20.13, is that all scripture? Is that part of our, our Bible? Is that part of, of the revelation of God? That is part of all Scripture. All means all. Okay, All Scripture is given, so that means it's a gift God gave, and He gave it in order that we would receive it. We have the choice to make whether we receive and believe it or not, but God gave all Scripture. My King James Bible is referring to me. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. What does that mean? Well, that means holy men of God spake, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Another place says we have also a more sure word of prophecy. That means more than dreams, more than visions, more than my interpretation, or my mind can conceive, or how I can explain a sense of something, or how I can give you my feeling about Scripture. More important than all of those things is the sure word of prophecy, I believe, contained here in the King James Bible. It was given by inspiration of God. In other words, God took holy men of God, sanctified, set apart, righteously seeking after him for the purpose that God had set forth. He spake through them as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God moved them through his Holy Ghost power to speak these words. We can go back to chapter 20 of Exodus and say, God spake all these words saying. We can go to Psalm chapter 12 and verse 6, and we can just believe that the words of God are pure words, and they are here exactly how they ought to be. 
We can trust that what we have is what we ought to have and that God took holy men and used them. God gave us a more sure word of God. Today, I believe that we have preserved in the King James Bible for the English-speaking people the perfect words of God. So I can say, without a shadow of doubt, my full faith in it, He spake all these words saying. He gave us then Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13 as something that is what? All scripture given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's beneficial for what? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. What's the end of that? That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So God gave us the Bible for the purpose of giving us doctrine or teaching. He gave us the Bible and every word of God for the purpose of reproving us, showing us where we have faults and errors in ourselves and in our collective. He gave us the Bible for a means of correction, right? You use correction tape if you intend to make the change that's appropriate. Correction takes the reproof that was made and helps to fix it, okay? So God did it for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. He corrects or he reproves, he corrects, and he instructs you in that same doctrine so that you may be perfect following after and doing what is right. To make perfect means to make one complete, prepared unto all good works. The scripture is given, doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and in righteousness to the end that the man of God may be perfect truly furnished unto all good works, prepared unto all good works. You have everything you need. You're truly furnished, truly able. You got everything you need. You got all the tools in the basket, right? You got everything to be furnished unto performing good works. Now, take that, what we have, and the affirmation that all Scripture is given for that purpose, and apply that back to Leviticus chapter 2013. What do we find? We find a doctrine. In the context of Leviticus chapter 13, and we can go there, Leviticus 20.13, if you kept your place. What did we find was the doctor. What did we find was the teaching. It's the same as given in the context. These sins, well, look at the previous verse, verse 20. Wrought confusion. These sins in general wrought confusion, created confusion. Confusion is like... Is, is like chaos. It's, it's, it's not understandable. It's, it's a mess. It's confusion. Have you ever, you know, woken up in the middle of the night, you didn't know where you were? You, you know, maybe you've slept over somewhere. You, maybe it happens in your own house. You're like, where in the world am I? That confusion is, is the, the same type of thing that is created, I believe, when these types of sins take place. They work. They rot confusion, okay? Now look right after that in verse 14, it says, it is wickedness. And so in the context of everything, the doctrine of what we are learning is confusion and it is wickedness. We have one verse later after 14 in verse 15, it talks about a man lying with a beast. Oh, all of us are just like, that's disgusting. Okay, the context here, the doctrine that is all encompassed by the context of around that verse is that it's, it's completely abnormal and filthy. It's... It's wickedness, it's confusion and working confusion. In other words, it's multiplying confusion in of itself. And there, right nestled in the middle of that context, we find Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13, where God is clear, it's abomination. Men lying with men is abomination, works confusion, it's wickedness. It's no different, contextually speaking, than men lying with beasts. Okay? That is the doctrine that we can pull as New Testament believers out of Leviticus 20.13. It's therefore reproof. So it's showing us very clearly there's great error in that act, of course, right? No one then, given the context of, hey, I want you to be sanctified. I want you to be holy. I want your land and your people to be sanctified and holy, right? The reproof shows the error in the act and also gives you the idea in the context that no one that does these things could ever be considered sanctified, holy, keeping God's statutes, or in or could be considered loved of God. He says, I abhorred them, not I abhorred their act. He says, the other nations did all of these things, I abhorred them. 
So if a man is lying with a mankind as he lieth with a woman, he is not holy. He is not sanctified. He is not keeping the statutes of the Lord God and doing them. But contrarywise, he's a court of God. He's wicked. He's committing abomination. He's he's working confusion. And he's laying with a beast. It's, it's disgusting, right? So anyone that would do such things then needs to be reproved sharply. Verse 23, it continues, and God says that exact statement, I afford them. He's not referring to the sin, he's referring to the people that would do such things. And again, we're being, we're being honest with the scriptures here, because did we not also find in that same context, verse 10, adultery? Okay, so the same thing would apply. God is abhorring the adulterer. God is abhorring and considering that working confusion, that being wickedness. He's saying, hey, you're not being sanctified. You're not being holy. You are not being righteous. You are not following my statutes if you're sinning in any of these things as the nation before did, and I vomited them out of that land. So he's showing reproof, the error in the very acts mentioned here. Now he's going to show correction. In God's kingdom, which we found in Israel as he laid out his laws when he was king, when he was master, when he was the final judge, jury, and executioner of the nation, it would be easy. Death penalty, plain and simple, done with, okay? That is the correction that takes place in the verse that we're seeing according to the New Testament belief. Now today, the Lord is not king. Is anybody, is anybody just like, whoa, really? <laughs> in, in Canada? That's not news to anybody. God is not ruling here. God is not king here. God's law is not the final authority here. Romans 13 asks us to, to yield unto the higher powers, and there's no power but of God. And so in these cases, there are many things that our nation does, though it is not right. It is not righteous. They should enact this law, and they shouldn't have a law like this. There are a lot of laws that happen in the government that we live in that don't head and shoulders just undeniably contradict the word of God. What does that mean? Well, if there's something that, the, you know, if the government says I have to hop on one foot on the way to work every day, right, a simplistic term, I don't have a Bible verse that God says don't do that. So I would just yield unto the higher powers being my government and hop to work on one foot. It's stupid. It's not right. Okay, fine. But the powers that be are ordained to, of God to do that particular task. Their authority would be overstepped because their responsibility is the punishment of evildoers, but they haven't caused me to sin in that area. Now, were it a righteous government doing what God mandates, their job would be the punishment of evildoers, and they would then look at this as evil and put to death that wicked person, that wicked man that lieth with another man, man as he does lie with a woman. So... Minding higher powers, given that it's the government's responsibility to put people to death in the first place, according to uh, Romans chapter 13, I have nothing to say, nor can I do anything in regard to the law where it says the sodomite should be put to death. I have no jurisdiction. That's government's responsibility. They're not doing it. I can't do nothing about it. I can disagree with it. I can say... Thus saith the Lord, I can stand up and I can preach it in thunder that they shall be put to death. They are worthy of death. Their blood shall be upon them, right? Because that's my, that's my biblical understanding of the scripture and how things ought to be. But we don't have any way of enforcing that here in this life. But, okay, just because our government will not be putting them to death, does that mean and open the floodgates for us to not treat them as if they ought to be. This, this is the key, okay? We're not breaking God's laws by not stoning them. <laughs> because the punishment of evildoers is the government's responsibility. They're breaking God's laws by not stoning them. We're kind of spectators here, okay? But... We're not given leave by God then to take somebody worthy of death and love them, try to uh, redeem them, try to try to meet in the middle with them, trying to bring them over to our side, trying to right. God considers them as good as dead. His law is just, so He says they do such things; they shall be put to death. Right. So. 
why would we then, as Bible believers then, knowing that that person were God the king, be dead, why are we trying to go give the gospel to a dead man? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. The government should put them to death, and that should be the end of it. But here we are, we're trying to bring them into the church house. We're trying to give them children's ministries. We're trying to love them to Jesus. It's not going to happen. They're dead. They're as good as dead. The Bible talks about them being twice dead. Why? Because they are lost and they have a dead soul that we all had, right? A dead spirit that needed to be alive and quickened. But on top of that, they are dead by the statutes of God that said they should be put to death. Okay? So we are not given then leave to go and love and try to redeem what God hates. The fourth point, instruction and righteousness. Don't do the sin, obviously. And I also believe don't love the people that do the sin. Love the sinner, hate the sin is not in the Bible. That's Gandhi. Okay? And Gandhi was a wicked, weirdo pervert. Okay? Gandhi, later in his life, when he was super old and ancient, had this thing where he really enjoyed sharing his bed with young women. Very young women. Under 20. Maybe. Who knows? That's what's published. Okay? He was a weird and wicked pervert, not only in his ideology, but in his actions. He thought to himself that he could achieve more nirvana by putting, putting the temptation of a young child in front of him and just not doing it. And do I believe for a second that he never committed the transgression? I, I don't, okay? But I'm not going to say anything about that because I don't know for sure. But that statement, love the sinner, hate the sin, sorry, Baptist, it's not in the Bible. Nor is that principle in the Bible. God clearly said, I abhorred them. Talking about the sinners, not the sin. Doesn't this contradict the idea that God loves everybody? We'll go to Romans chapter 1. Okay? I'm going to try to hit the runway quick here. And as you go to Romans chapter 1, let me talk to you about John 3.16. God so loved... The world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's exhibiting and showing that God loved. That's a past tense statement to me. That means that at some point in time, God loved the whole world. That doesn't carry forward then into every scenario and every situation, even unto today. God loved the world. What's his opinion now of those that commit these types of sins? Romans chapter 1 now, the Bible does record in John chapter 3, or in, in 1 John, it says, We love him because he first loved us. And by extension of principle, and what I'm going to show you from Romans chapter 1 is regarding the Sodomites, he hates them because they first rejected him. It, it's, it's, the, it's the backwards of that statement. The biblical statement, God, we love God because he first loved us. He hates them because they first rejected and abhorred him. He's just, he's just sharing the, in the exchange, right? We exchange love with our Savior. He'll exchange hatred with whoever wants to give him of the same. That's, that, God's okay with that. You'll get what you want. You'll reap what you sow. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. The Bible says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Okay, so these are ones that hold the truth in an unrighteous way. Verse 19, because that when, which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. What is that saying? Manifest means to make clear, to make plain, to make visible. Why would it be so? Because God hath showed it unto them. His wrath is manifest because what is known of God is manifest, made clear, because God was the one that showed it. Verse 20 continues, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are, look at this, clearly seen. So it's manifest, God showed it, and it's clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There is no excuse. Why? It's clearly seen. God showed it. God manifested himself and what could be known about him unto this group that we are referring to. Verse 21, Because that, when they knew God, when they knew God. So this group knows God. Why? Because God seems to have gone out of his way to show himself unto them. He really emphasized manifesting what could be known of him. And to the end that they knew God, verse 21 reveals. They knew God. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. 
neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. What is that saying? They knew God. God made it simple, made it clear, put it down on the bottom shelf so that they could understand. And when they knew God, they did refuse to glorify Him as God. They rejected God and what could be known about Him. And not also, on top of that, they were not thankful for the fact that God had went out of His way to talk about himself, to express himself, to manifest himself and show himself unto them. They weren't thankful, but instead became vain or empty or useless or pointless in their own imaginations and their thoughts, and it talks about their foolish heart being darkened. Foolish, stupid, ignorant. Mind became a blackened and darkened heart to these Professing themselves, verse 22, to be wise, they became fools. That's part of the imagination. They're like, I'm so wise in this. I'm wise in my own conceits. I have this all figured out. Yeah, I know of God because he's shown what could be known of him, but I reject it entirely. The Bible records of this group there without excuse. Verse 23, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Okay? So now that they know God is true, yet reject Him and to give Him the proper place, they're just going to make up gods to themselves, out of their own imaginations, their own darkened, foolish hearts, which was the same problem we saw expressed back in Leviticus, was it not? That they would follow after these things, which is why God spent chapters upon chapters saying, don't do these things, and even gave them Ten Commandments. Here we have a group that rejected them purposely, wherefore, verse 24, God also gave them up. You know what that also is there for? It shows that they gave God up. Wherefore, God also gave them up. Because they gave God up. Right? They reaped what they sowed. They want none of God, so he's like, fine. God gave them up. To uncleanness, through the lust of their own heart, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, for this reason, God gave them up unto vile affections. They've been given up to uncleanness. They've been given up to vile affections. And what's he going to talk about now? Another simile or another descriptor of the sins that we had referred to earlier. He says, God gave them up unto vile affections for even their women to change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural normal, suitable, proper use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. They knew God. They gave up God. Therefore, God gave them up. God gave them up. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things. And that's what verse 28 says. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You want to reject me from your mind? Have at it. Here it is. You can have that reprobate mind. And they're filled with what? It doesn't say they exhibit these traits. It doesn't say some of these things they do. It says they are filled with, the one with the reprobate mind, the one that been, has been given up, given up, given over by God, is filled with unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breaks, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit some things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. In other words, they relish in the fact that they can encourage others to do the same. Now your average sodomite, you will not necessarily, your average reprobate, you will not necessarily see all of these things exhibited, but make note that those things are in them. Those things, they are capable of you. Remember how God had to manifest himself to show exactly who he was? These are cautious to manifest themselves to show exactly who they are. Why? Because if they showed exactly what they are, even this world would condemn them. Murderers. Backbiters. Covenant breakers. Wicked. Malicious. Full of envy, right? Haters of God is a key term there. 
They want to hate God, therefore God hates them. Now, we're talking about instruction and in righteousness that we as New Testament believers can take out of this. Well, instruction for dealing with these is to not follow after them. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Maybe we don't need to uh, spend too much time on this, but Psalm 139. We're encouraged in the New Testament to speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, mm -hmm. singing and making melody in our hearts unto the Lord. And so there the Apostle Paul says, hey, psalms are a New Testament thing that we ought to sing and get doctrine from. Psalm 139, verse 21, it says, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. And am not, am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Oh, this is just David being honest in his song and how he feels. But David's heart's been tried. Look at verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We should have that desire in our hearts every time we walk before God and throughout our day to have Him search us and know us and, and, and prove our motives when we're walking before Him. The doctrine here is that David was to not love them that hate God, but rather hate them with perfect or complete hatred, counting them as enemy. That's the instruction in righteousness. We're righteous when we're not loving on those that hate God. It's, it's, a, it's a very strange and weird contradiction. If, if I was good friends with and trying to love on and trying to bless somebody that hated my wife. We'll continue to explain the practical application from the verse in 2020. The Bible says in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Gives a second witness to that. Verse 6. Now these things were written for our examples to the end that we should not lust after evil things. It's also they lusted. Neither be idolaters, as some were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat, to drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye. It says in verse 11, Now these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. These are all Old Testament stories that are there for us to learn from and be admonished from so that we don't do the same. They're there for us to learn how to relate to those that do such things. And what do we learn from that? Don't love them or help them. Jude 7 gives us an example of hellfire to come on those that commit such things. You can go there in your own time. You can see the example then of something strange happening and help to save others from that knowing the end, right? Jude chapter 7 talks about that. Right before Revelation. I'm going to go there quick. In Jude chapter 7, I, I've memorized it previous, but it says, Jude verse 7, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Talking about the vengeance of eternal fire at the end, that is the strange flesh. Twice dead at that moment. But that gives you that little bit of a window where it's like fornication is what they gave themselves to, and the end of it all was the strange flesh. So we should take heed to that and understand that we have an opportunity to pull people out of that same fire before they get there. It says in verse 21, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. We ought to try to save others by fear or by compassion and pull them out of these sins that lead them on to these strange sins to follow after. Second Peter, you can go to quickly, Second Peter in chapter 2 talks about another practical application for the believer. 
2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6, and it says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overflow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and deliver just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The first principle, don't love them or help them. The second principle, see their example and understand the direction so that we can save others before they follow after it. Thirdly, don't be vexed in seeing and in hearing of their unlawful deeds. And in general, know and be aware of the filth and depravity of the Sodomite. We can go through Genesis 19, we can go through Judges 19, and we can find the simple and plain example that they are perverted. They commit lewdness with young and old. They go both ways. They're a violent group. They're implacable, unmerciful. And Romans 1 gives us a big list of all the things that they are filled with. And so our practical application in the New Testament is to take these things for our learning and understand that they are there to be examples so that we don't follow that direction, we help others to not follow that direction, and ultimately we just judge righteously as God does and do our best to live in the land now according to the statutes that he gives us. Treat them as dead. Stay away from them. Guard your soul and most importantly guard the children and their lives from those that commit such things that are worthy of death, but God forbid they're not being put to death, unfortunately. Okay? So here it is, Leviticus chapter 23, in its context, with practical application for the believer in 2020, the plain understanding to a New Testament Christian, given what it meant to those that heard these words from heaven in that day.